Welcome to the Good Food CFO Podcast. I'm Sarah Delavan, and I'm joined once again by our producer, Chelsea Steer. Hey, Chels. Hey, Sarah. How's it going? It's going well. I heard you have an update for us on the book club. I do. But before I get to that, I just want to remind all of our listeners to subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to the podcast. And also, I'd love to ask wherever you listen or watch to please leave a rating and review because that is the number one way that we get this message out to more founders. But yes, I do have an update. It is about our Good Food CFO book club. It has been brought to our attention that our current selection, The Great Game of Business, is currently on back order in our bookshop. (laughs) Such a bummer. We still want you to join us for the book club fireside chat. And at the same time, we still want you to be able to get the book through our bookshop because when doing so, you do support bookshops across the country, independent bookstores, and also this podcast. So we are temporarily delaying the fireside chat for this book club until we know that the book is no longer on back order and that you are all going to be able to receive it. So stay tuned for updates on that. Are folks able to purchase the book on back order and it simply won't ship until until it's back in stock? Like, is that a possibility or do we yes, just need absolutely. to? absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So if you go to our website and click on bookshop, you'll see the book club collection or selection in our bookshop and you just can click on it. It does say back ordered, but you can still order it and then you'll receive it, like you said, when it is back in stock. Amazing. Well, thank you for that update. I have sort of a fun thing for us to talk about in the news segment today. Okay. I got a an article link from one of our community members. Little shout out to Bake Up. Thank you for sending this article to me. The founder, Kim, thought that this would be a really interesting thing to follow along. And I thought, well, Snoop Dogg and Master P, I mean, are an obvious topic yeah. fit for the Good Food CFO podcast. But it turns out the two of them have founded a cereal brand. It's called Broadus Foods. And the cereal lines are called Snoop Cereal and Mama Snoop. They're actually suing Post Cereal and Walmart. And that is the part of the story that I want to talk about. Yeah. Well, Sarah, why are they suing them? So Broadus Foods actually pitched their product to companies like Post, which the lawsuit says made an all-out offer to buy the cereal brand, but they rejected the offer. Broadus Foods rejected the offer, and instead they entered into a partnership with Post so that Snoop Cereal would be distributed alongside Post's dozens of other brands at all major retailers. However, and this is a quote from the article, It says, however, Post, despite agreeing to the partnership, allegedly sabotaged the success of Snoop Cereal by preventing it from reaching consumers through deceptive practices, especially at Walmart. So for example, Broadus Food contends that boxes of Snoop Cereal were intentionally kept in the stock rooms of Walmart stores marked with, quote, no location coding, preventing them from being placed on store shelves. Now, I wanted to bring this article to the podcast right away after learning about it because this is something that we see with small brands. Yeah, I'm very curious to learn why a company would even do something like this. So here's the thing. It's like, I don't have an answer for you. And what I will say first is that distribution is a somewhat complex system, right? So when a brand sells their product to a distributor, it has to be in the distributor's system. In order for a distributor to place a PO with a brand, it has to mm-hmm. be in their system. It has to be the right product, it has to have all the right information for it, et cetera, et cetera. Once that happens, then the distributor can order the product and then they can also receive the product from the brand. Then in order for the distributor to ship to a retailer, the retailer has to have the brand's product in their system. And only once it's in their system, can they actually place an order 
with the distributor. Yeah. Not only that, when the product is delivered to the retail store and is in the back room, like stock room, right, is what you would call it, it indeed has to have a location to go on the store floor in order for it to actually make it out to the store floor. So very recently, one of my clients ran into the situation where they have two products. One product is in the system perfectly well and makes it to the retailer from the distributor and makes it onto the store shelf. The other product, the store can't order it from the distributor. So one product is moving through perfectly fine and the other one is not. And it took weeks to resolve. Now this is the brand calling the retailer. What is the problem? Like, why are you not ordering the product that you said that you wanted? It's sitting in our distributor location. They're threatening to discontinue this product because it's not getting ordered. And the retailer is saying, we don't know what the problem is. There's some sort of technical issue in our system and we're trying to figure it out. I'm not going to share the specific details of the situation because of NDAs and and privacy reasons, but suffice it to say that they found the problem. It was just a technical error, a data error. There was like something happening in their system that was preventing this product from being added. And once it was added, it could indeed be purchased from the distributor and can now be on the retail shelf. So I'm not saying that Snoop and Master P are wrong. I I am not saying that there may not be deceptive and and malicious activity here. I have no idea. But what I am saying is that this is something that happens all of the time in the industry and it costs small businesses thousands of dollars, not only in lost sales, but also in when it gets to the point where the distributor is like, this product is not moving and we need to ship it back to you. Ugh. It's just a, it's an, it's a super expensive thing, and we know that that can actually cause some businesses to fail depending on how large the order was. And that's something that I'm thinking about too. Is you know when you have someone like Snoop, right, or or Master P, like they have the resources to file a lawsuit or yeah. dig into what is the issue here, right? their lives aren't on the line, right? Mm -hmm. Or their livelihoods are not on the line in this situation. But I can't imagine a a good food founder going through something like this. All of the costs that you just laid out, it could be devastating. Yeah, it absolutely could be devastating. And I'll share another example of what this could look like. And I'd actually love to hear from founders who have found themselves in this situation or where their product was stuck at maybe either in the back of a store, um, because that can happen, or at the distributor. So another example of this is when a store, and in this example, it was like a pretty large, it was a national chain. The product is supposed to be on shelf in every store nationally. Mm -hmm. The distributor has all of the product in stock. You can see the stock levels. You can see that the product is there. The retailer is placing the order and the product is being labeled as out of stock and not being delivered to the retailer. Mm. What happens in that instance is two things. One, sales volume is obviously very low at the retail stores. They're not selling any product. They're not looking into the why of that. All they know is that the product is out of stock at the distributor. They aren't able to receive it. They aren't making any money on that relationship. And therefore, if that continues for long enough or the numbers are bad enough, especially in comparison to other similar products, you know, on shelf, they're going to discontinue that product. And that is what we have seen happen. Huge amounts of investment to open up this national chain, right? Tens of thousands of dollars in free fills or slotting fees to get the product on shelf. And then the retail stores are ordering the product and it's not being delivered. And this is not a case where a founder is just sitting back and saying, well, there's nothing I can do here. They're trying and their hands are tied and they just can't change anything. Yeah. And the end result is discontinuation from that retailer and a, a large amount of product. In this particular case, a PO was canceled, which that's like a whole nother topic of conversation for another day. But that means that product was created, product was palletized, and then it was left 
with nowhere to go. And then Mm. additionally, there was product that was unsellable. And so the options are, we're going to destroy it, or we're going to donate it, or we can ship it. You you can find another outlet for it, but guess what? The brand pays for the shipping. Yeah. So I'm so thankful for Kim for sharing this article with us. I think it gives us the opportunity to talk about some realities in the industry, right? Putting it out there so that people understand this is something very real that can happen, that it is difficult to navigate. It happens on a, you know, for famous people with, with brands, it happens for unfamous people with brands. And it's something about the industry that I think needs to change. Not that the technology will always be perfect, but if these types of things are happening, there has to be some, some level of action that, that brands can actually take to get their product on the shelf. And that doesn't exist right now. Yeah. I'll wrap this up by just pointing out that Post and Walmart were reached out to for comment. And essentially at this time, they say like, we'll respond as appropriate with the court, you know, once we are actually served with the Mm -hmm. complaint. So this is very new news. I think we will definitely follow this as it progresses through the courts, you know, if it does and keep you updated. And I think it'll be interesting to, to see what is uncovered here. Yeah. It'll be a very interesting story to follow. Yeah. Well, Switching gears, because I didn't tease the the episode content at the top of our conversation today, but we're talking about cash flow in a, a bit of a different way today on the podcast. Rather than talking about how margins affect your cash flow, I'm sharing the three ways that you can project and manage your cash flow. This is something that I think is invaluable for businesses to do, especially if you're a founder who doesn't love the forecasting process. Maybe you're overwhelmed by the forecasting process. The cash flow projection process can can actually feel a lot easier for you, but accomplish a lot of the same goals. And likewise, if you're someone who hates having a budget and having to like work within, you know, a confined, you know, sort of like spending limit, we find that cash flow projections also help you feel a little bit freer and they're actually easier to stick to. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. One of my big takeaways, right, is having a plan that you can look at and then go, hmm, what if? Mm -hmm. What if? Yeah. What if I change this? What if I change that? So yeah, I love it. I think we should dive right in. All right. Let's get to it. Are you looking for support to tackle the financial work of growing or sustaining a profitable food business? without hiring a consultant? Or maybe you want a different way to look at your food business financials. Now you can join Sarah Delavan for the weekly CFO office hours inside the Good Food CFO community. Our setting allows you to get FaceTime with Sarah and a small group of your peers. Each week, the group will dive into the work that you're doing, support you when you're feeling stuck, and give you the confidence that you're on the path to profitability. You can get more information by going to thegoodfoodcfo.com and clicking on services. And now back to the show. I recently received a message in my DMs on Instagram from someone who was pointing out that I had changed a lot of my talk around finances from a profit focus to a cash flow focus. And they were curious whether or not profit first was something that I thought could work for food businesses. And the first thing that came to mind was I was really happy that this person and hopefully others are observing and catching on to the fact that we are indeed talking about cash flow a lot more often than we are talking about profitability. And that's important. I think Chelsea and I talked about it a couple of episodes ago that you know, it's an intentional change from talking about profitability to talking about cash flow. And one of the primary reasons that that's the case is because every business has cash flow. It is either positive cash flow or negative cash flow. To make sure we're all on the same page in in terms of understanding these words, positive cash flow means your business is making more money than it is spending right within a certain time frame. So if you look at weekly cash flow, right, you'd be making more money and revenue in a week than you're spending in a week. Generally, we look at this on a monthly basis, right? But you can sort of look at it however you want. 
If you have negative cash flow, it means that you are spending more than you are making in revenue within a particular time frame. And knowing whether your business has positive cash flow or negative cash flow is extremely important because without cash, you cannot operate your business. There will come a point if you have negative cash flow for too long where you will run out of money and you won't be able to support your business in any kind of way. Another reason that we talk about cash flow so much is because you can actually have a profitable business. Your P&L or your income statement can show a profit, but you may simultaneously have negative cash flow. There are businesses that have that situation and ultimately close their doors because they didn't have the cash to operate. And it can be confusing, right? Like if you've ever looked at your P&L and said, okay, I'm profitable here, but I don't have that amount of money in my bank account, it's because cash flow and your profit and loss statement are not looking at the same thing. A P&L is a snapshot in time, right? In the past in particular. And it's looking at the operational profitability of your business, meaning within a given time frame, how much revenue did you generate and how much did you spend on operations? And the reason I said, how much did I spend on operations rather than how much money did I spend is because, and COGS is a great example of this. A lot of businesses track their cost of goods sold based on the number of units they've sold in a month. For example, if you sell a thousand units of a product, your cost of goods sold will be the cost to produce those 1,000 products. And that's important information to see and to understand, but that's not cash flow because it's unlikely that you purchased exactly 1,000 units of product in that month, right? It's more likely that you made, right, or purchased from your co-packer thousands of products, maybe not even in that month. It might've been months before. And a lot of cash, a lot more cash than what is showing in that cost of goods sold section went out of your business at some point in time. So the P&L serves a purpose and we need to look at it and understand it, right? And understand how our business is doing operationally. But we also need to keep an eye on our cash flow and fully understand, as I said earlier, whether we have positive cash flow or negative cash flow. The third reason that we talk about cash flow a lot more than we talk about profitability here is because we can look at parts of our business and create change that will have an immediate impact on cash flow and can flip a negative cash flow situation to a positive cash flow situation really, really quickly. We saw that, you know, in real life in the pulling out of retail episode, right? And in the case of Vermont Tortilla, their cash flow changes were pretty quick and significant. And they also saw that represented on their PL pretty quickly as well. But in the case of Semolina Pasta, the cash flow changes were also, you know, really quick for them. But changes to that profit and loss statement took a little bit more time. They didn't see profitability. I wanted to do an episode of the podcast where we talked about the importance of cash flow in terms of cash flow management and cash flow 
projection because recently in my work at Sarah Delavan Consulting, there have been a couple of businesses, a couple of founders who were a bit averse to this idea of a cash flow projection and having support around cash flow management. And it just happened to be that most of those founders were in a situation where they had little cash on hand or they were experiencing negative cash flow and they just didn't see the value in doing the work, right? Of having that cash flow projection and needing to look at it. And I understand that when you don't have a lot of something, cash in particular, that looking at that fact in detail is a scary and at best very uncomfortable thing to do. It's like opening past due bills, right? When you don't have the money to pay them, you don't do it. You avoid them. You toss them in the trash. But the bills are not going to go away just because you're not looking at them and you're tossing them in the trash. Now, I also know that opening the bills is not going to make money magically appear. But what it will do is allow you to create a plan, allow you to understand what the realities of your financial situation are and create a plan to get out of that situation and into a better one. When you have a cash flow projection, you can create a cash plan and a financial plan for your business and simultaneously work on your business right? Focusing on things like your pricing, your profit margins, your production efficiency, all in an effort to improve that cash flow. We have businesses that we've created cash flow projections for that have a lot of past due bills. And part of the practice is looking at those past due bills and not necessarily saying we know we're going to pay them or we're going to try to pay them all right away, right? But we understand what the total past to do is for each of the vendors that they owe money to. We also look at what bills are due now and what must be paid, and we create a plan. And we also dig into the business to focus on how to improve cash flow. And what I want to talk about here today, whether you are struggling with cash flow right now or not, are ways that you can create a cash flow projection. I just had a call with a business owner the other day who has enough cash on hand right now that if she didn't sell a single thing after the month of January, she has enough money to pay all of her bills for the rest of the year. This is an excellent cash position to be in, right? Because it means that you are abundant in cash. It means that you can make some investments if you want to. It means maybe she can pay herself more. It means maybe, you know, some of that gets tucked away and invested into a new piece of equipment, right? You have options, right? But most of all, it means that she's financially secure in a cash sense and that she can go on operating for at least one more year. And this is in a worst case scenario where she doesn't sell a single penny worth of product for the rest of the year. We also have clients who, once we create their cash flow projection, they've got two weeks of cash in the bank, right? And I think those are very important times to set up your cash flow projection. And what we do is we set a initial goal of getting to a 12-week cash runway. And what that means, what cash runway means is how long will the money I have today last me? So in the case of the the business owner that I was just talking about, their cash runway is 12 months because without selling anything more, they have the ability to cover all of their expenses for at least the next 12 months. Okay. Our first goal is to get three weeks of cash in the business. And that the way of going about that looks different for every business, but it's a goal that we have. And then from there, we try to extend that cash runway longer and longer. And every business will have a different goal. And that's part of the beauty of building a business on your own terms, right? But it's not safe to operate with, you know, generally less than three months of cash in the business. And it doesn't mean you have to have all of that in savings, 
It doesn't mean that, but we want you to have a bit of a safety net and that's our starting point. And so if you're listening to this, maybe you don't know what your cash runway is. Maybe you don't know how long your cash will last you. Maybe you have some debt that you want to pay back, right? And you aren't quite sure how to manage those repayments. Having a cash flow projection is an amazing tool to utilize to sort that out. It can replace a budget, which I think is a really interesting thing to talk about. So Chelsea's not here with us today recording, but when we were prepping this episode, she shared with me that she hates budgets. She hates budgeting, feels very restrictive. And when she switched from a budget and kind of looking at her finances personally in that way to having a cash flow projection, she loved it. Because despite the fact that a cash flow projection essentially being a budget, right? This is how much money I have. This is when I'm expecting my next inflow of money. These are all of my expenses. It's not as rigid because you are able to enter what ifs, right? What if I didn't earn any money this week or this month? What if I spent, you know, a couple of hundred dollars on clothing? What if I went on this vacation? What if I paid down you know, a bunch of debt, right? The cash flow projector, you know, depending on which tool you're using, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute, is going to show you how what you do today will affect your cash down the road, right? And so you could see if you spend $1,000 today, when are you going to run out of money? Or when will your bank account get to a scarily low balance, right? As I mentioned at the top of the episode, in the DM that I received on social media, the founder asked if I thought Profit First was a good tool or system for food businesses to use or not. And I want to say that I no longer promote or talk about being a Profit First consultant because I'm not actively a member of Profit First professionals. And according to their rules, which I completely respect, I cannot do that. But as a cash flow management system, as a budgeting system, I think that it has good foundations and I think that it can work for some businesses. But there are other tools and other systems that I utilize. And I want to talk about Profit First and those other systems here today. So let's dive into them. Starting with Profit First, right? In this cash flow management methodology, you've got separate bank accounts that you set up for income and then each of your primary expenses. Usually there's a cost of goods sold account, a payroll account, and an operating expense account. And then more advanced users of this method may also have accounts for other things like owner's pay, marketing, future equipment investments, things of that nature. In this cash flow management system, you're actually utilizing the bank accounts to help you manage your money and create your spending limitations for you, right? So all of the money that you are generating in your business goes into the income account and then is divvied up across your expense accounts according to a predetermined percentage. We determine the percentages through our profit assessment and then build out a little calculator where we enter income for the week and then it tells us how much to move to each of the individual accounts. The goal of this method is to only spend the money that you have. So if you have $10,000 in the operating expense account, that's how much you have available to spend, right? Where I think that this super simple method falls a little bit short for food businesses is twofold. Number one, there are often big expenditures in advance of getting paid. And if you literally wait until you have all of the cash you need in your cost of goods account, you could run out of product or create a shortage of some of your products while you're waiting for that money to build up. There is also no real view of how long your cash on hand will last or what your cash runway is, right? So let's say that from that $10,000 in your operating account, you spent 8,000 of that. There's no real foresight into like, what other expenses do I have coming up and will I have enough money to pay those? So oftentimes people will have the profit first accounts and then some other spreadsheet or tool that's helping them to figure out, you know, 
how they should actually spend that money that's in their checking accounts. I know that this method was designed for service-based businesses, and over the years it's been tweaked and modified to work for other types of businesses like I've done for food businesses. And I think that this can be a good method if you're a food business that doesn't have a lot of big purchases or customers on like really long net terms, right? Net 30, net 60, net 90. Part of the tweaking that I've done to Profit First is to use a budgeting tool in conjunction with the Profit First allocations, which brings me to cash flow management method number two, which is YNAB or some other budgeting tool. So YNAB stands for you need a budget. And we actually utilize YNAB in conjunction with Profit First for a number of our clients at Sarah Delavan Consulting. And if a client doesn't utilize Profit First or doesn't kind of subscribe to that methodology, we still use YNAB to help with their cash flow management. This method brings in the awareness of what is called a burn rate or how much money you are spending each month. Now, YNAB is designed for personal use. So they pre-build budgets for users and we discard those and then make a new one, a custom budget, if you will, from scratch for each of our clients. But what they have in common are the following categories. We have income, profit, cost of goods sold, payroll, operating expenses, and then debt slash credit cards. We want to get a big picture view of how much cash is being spent each month. And we want to see it by category. And we also want to see how much income is coming in on a weekly and monthly basis as well. And we like to see it historically. So in order to do that, I create what's called holding accounts. So in each of those categories that I just described, I create a budget line that is called the holding account. So there'll be an income holding account. When cash comes in, it goes to that budget line. Then there's a payroll holding account. When I move money from the income account or the income budget line, if you will, to payroll, it goes to payroll holding. Same for COGS. We put the money in COGS holding. That gives us a bit of a stamp, a little timestamp of this is how much money has been moved to this category within the week or the month. And again, we can kind of go back and look at it historically. Then when we spend money or we project spending, let's say we have under COGS, we have ingredient COGS, we have labor COGS, and we have packaging COGS. I like to project what we're going to spend, right? And when I know, okay, there's a $5,000 packaging spend coming up, that money comes out of COGS holding and goes into the COGS packaging line. And we know that that money is set aside and available. And we can then also see after we've budgeted each of our COGS expenses, right, the specific ones, we can see how much of a COGS budget overall we have remaining. So you can see how this is that extra layer and sort of added ability to both project spending we know is going to happen, but also see how much money we'll have left over that the standard profit first method doesn't necessarily provide. So we've got in some cases, the profit first methodology in conjunction with YNAB or just YNAB itself for this kind of visual. Whenever we have a recurring expense, which is typically a lot of the operating expenses, we make a budget line for those recurring expenses. And I typically put a payment date in the description and then set an amount due. And this way, when I have my operating expense holding account, for example, I can go ahead and project all of the payments that are going to come out for the rest of the month, right? If I get, let's say one week into the future, I know that I have a one week cash runway. If I'm able to project from operating expenses, all of my expenses for the month, right? Before they are actually even incurred, I know I have a one month runway. We, as I said earlier, are trying to shoot for 12 weeks, which is three months. So as we're working on our cash flow, I love it when we can flip to the next month in YNAB and continue to project those expenses far into the future. So again, this methodology gives us a certain level of clarity and 
ability to see into the future and how far the money we have today is going to take us. YNAB also helps us to see if we have a shortfall in one of our budget categories and need to borrow from another budget category. And this is really helpful because then we can readjust our budget or look into why are we spending more than we theoretically should be in each of our spending categories. YNAB is my favorite tool to use in instances where a business is either low on cash and or uses a credit card for the majority of their purchases. In these cases, our goal is often to get the business to sustainability, meaning that they are bringing in enough cash to cover their expenses in cash every month, and so they're not increasing their debt, right? YNAB is so cool in that it allows us to see what the credit card purchases are each month, and it enables you to, quote, cover those expenses with cash, which then funnels the money in your budget down to the credit card payment line. I also like this version for farmers market-based businesses or other businesses that don't have a lot of customers with long payment terms. Where YNAB falls a little bit short is in projecting future income. So while I don't typically project a year's worth of income in a cash flow projection, I typically only project, you know, invoices that I know are coming due payable or average weekly, you know, Shopify income or retail income. YNAB does not let you do this. You really have to kind of play with the system to project income beyond the cash that you have actually received and that is actually in the bank right now. And that brings me to option number three, which is managing your cash flow with a good old spreadsheet. I use what I refer to as a classic spreadsheet. It's a model that has been around for probably as long as spreadsheets have existed. And I have to admit that when I was presented with it, I was strongly averse to using it. I thought, why would I manually project cash flow when there are so many tools that help you do it in an automated way? And the answer is because no tool does it as good as Excel and no tool allows you to customize what you're looking at on the level that Excel does. Most software is projecting on a monthly basis. Maybe you'll find one somewhere that allows you project on a weekly basis. And it's all really high level, not built for someone managing their cash on a daily basis, which is most often the case when a new business comes to us because they're struggling with cash flow. And in those cases, we have to make decisions about what bills to pay day to day and week to week to keep the business going and make sure that we have enough cash on hand. And it's only when we get the business to a healthy place that we can start to take that longer view. And truthfully, even then, I like to see the detail weekly because I know that what I'm looking at is correct and accurate. And if someone doesn't pay a bill or a bill suddenly pops up for a big repair that we weren't expecting, it is so easy to update an Excel-based cash flow projection and see how the change is going to affect your cash right away and a few weeks down the road. Similar to YNAB, you're listing out your recurring bills with the due date, usually, you know, alongside of it. But instead of monthly projections, we're looking at the cash flow weekly for a minimum of the next 12 weeks. And we're putting the expense amount in the column or the week in which the expense will be debited from the checking account. We enter cost of goods sold expenses, payroll expenses, credit card payments. Now, those are the you know, to pay down the balance only, no actual purchases on the credit card are tracked in the Excel version. And where it really gets different is that we're also tracking projected income week by week. So we can see the cash flow by week, meaning positive cash flow or negative cash flow for the week. And we're seeing a projected bank account balance 12 weeks into the future. I will tell you that when we start out, there's often a lot of weeks in the 12-week preview that have a red projected bank balance, meaning it's negative. And when we turn all of the projected weeks green, it is very, very exciting. It wasn't too long ago that we flipped 
one of our clients to an all green 12 month projection. And it was a moment of celebration for us. If someone doesn't pay something on time, we can move their payment to the next week. Same with bills. If they aren't debited on the date expected, we can move it, right? So Excel or Sheets allows you to have a very, very flexible cash flow projection. I think the downside of this method is time. Depending on how complex a business is, meaning how many different ways you receive money, how many customers you may have, et cetera, it can take time, especially in terms of projecting income each week to make sure that you've got accurate numbers in your projection. But we usually work out a system and use supporting tools to help us do the work like QuickBooks or Melio or Bill.com, which are bill pay tools. Lastly, I'll note that this method allows us to set goals with founders. For example, if we see that the bank account is projected to go red in three weeks by $2,000, we can strategize ways to bring that money in. And in a lot of cases, it can motivate founders or the accounts receivable person to get on top of customers that have past due bills to get that money in the door and keep the cash flow positive. I think most of all, seeing your cash flow this way gives a founder awareness and perspective and the motivation and the ability to make changes, create opportunities, and change your cash flow situation. Sometimes people feel helpless around cash, right? Or scared, just wanting to avoid it. And The truth is that when you see the information all laid out in front of you, it becomes very concrete and very approachable. I hope that no matter what your current cash flow situation, but especially if you have a limited amount of cash on hand right now, or you're living in a period of time where you're dealing with negative cash flow, that you will think about and look into the variety of cash flow management methods and tools that I talked about today. And if you're interested, in learning more about our cash flow projection tool, just visit thegoodfoodcfo.com and click on cash flow projector. We've got more information for you there. For more content like this and connection with other food founders and industry experts, join us inside the Good Food CFO community. Just visit thegoodfoodcfo.com slash join to learn more. Thank you for joining us here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please share it with your founder friends on social and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help good food founders find the show. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week.